Okay, I'd like to give you guys uh, some, uh, a talk on nanoparticles and sunscreen applications. It's an area that I've been engaged in for, uh, for, a, for a long time, for many years. But I want to, I, I sort of took this approach from taking this approach from not using the uh, sunscreen application as a platform for the technology. It's an interesting technology. But also, uh, I wanted to take this as a way in which when you do nanoscience, it's actually a different model in the way we're doing research and how scholarly research is defined. And so I want to say a few things at the beginning and the end here um, about the way you approach research that has a lot of translational value in it and a lot of things such as ethics and other aspects of human health and safety and environmental uh, issues in it all together packaged in one big giant research project. Um, I had a lot of... Uh, uh, colleagues at uh, Brown University that I worked with and students in the past that have worked on certain aspects of this project and more recently in the last few years had folks from Notre Dame working on this and also a, a contact at the IU School of Medicine in dermatology and the funding came from the National Science Foundation and believe it or not NASA for sunscreen applications. And so the presentation, I'll talk about basic discovery and timeline to translation, but I want to end with uh, sort of this application and how we're thinking about sunscreen. I think it's a little bit different than the way other people are thinking about it in terms of nanoparticles. Okay? I like to show this at the very beginning because I think this sort of picture really translates well into what nanoscience and nanotechnology is placed in the overall big picture in the research enterprise. First, this is called Pasteur's Quadrant. You can call it anybody's quadrant, I guess. But on one axis, it's quest for fundamental understanding, and on the other axis here, it's consideration for use. And so if you have a yes here for understanding and no consideration for use, they often call that the Bohr Quadrant for research, famous physicists, quantum mechanics, et cetera. And it probably took 30 years before quantum mechanics was really translated into transistors and, and medical lasers and things like that. So he didn't really have an application in mind, only the fundamental stuff. Now, if you look down here, no on fundamental understanding and yes on consideration for use, this may be fair or unfair, but sometimes we get the thing called the Edisonian approach, and usually that's a negative, but uh, nevertheless, uh, whatever you think of Edison and how he approached problems, he did you know, try 8,000 different times for the tungsten wire to make a light bulb, so it was very empirical. So this is more sort of empirical research. But I think today, in the contemporary university, I think this is where nanoscience really fits. And that is, it's the translational aspect of it where it's use-inspired, largely. There's a lot of consideration for use, and also there's a big quest for fundamental understanding. And if you really look through the literature, I've been trying to do this a lot in, in nano, that even if it's a very basic study on surface characterization or something, the first couple of paragraphs are always motivated by an application. And many papers are centered around applications. So we're really thinking about, I think about nano in, in this sort of region, and I think why I like to frame this particular sunscreen project in this realm is because if you really want to be successful here um, in terms of moving something out and to be successful to launching into society, et cetera, you really have to be talking with business people and lawyers and uh, talking with ethicists and people that deal with human health and safety and toxicity, et cetera. And so it's a very different kind of research landscape that we're in now than I think we were in before. I think you heard this yesterday. And I think early integration is very important now, especially in nanoscience. I think you heard a nice, nice example of, uh, well, you look at quantum mechanics turned into a transistor and the medical lasers in the 1960s, but it was kind of parallel processing. Science, engineering, value creation, launch, okay? And you heard some, probably some bad stories yesterday, asbestos, wonderful, neat material, became a great building insulation material in the 60s, and then 30 years later we have a problem with the health. DDT is another example for pesticides and environmental human health. And thus, when you kind of parallel, when you kind of serial process science, I think you can end up like this. And I, I think we're thinking in nanotechnology in a different way, which this conference is about, and that is where you, the science is combined with value creation and entrepreneurship and engineering, and also we're thinking about the societal impacts of it, which involve ethics and human health and safety. And also in nano, I think we should be thinking as researchers. I know it's sometimes hard to get your head buried in a laboratory and thinking about what that next discovery might be. But uh, this comes into play, came into play uh, largely in the biomedical area too, in biomedical engineering. And it's called the nano divide. And just to sort of, on this axis, complexity from simple to sophisticated, to hear from poor to rich nations, wealthy nations on this axis. And, and there's a lot of things that wealthy nations on the high end, advanced healthcare, genetics and cancer that we're looking into for nano, military and security applications, then even toys and gaming on the low end here. 
But because of this large investment, it's actually hard to transport that knowledge to some developing countries. And there are actually very nice applications for nano, in particular in water purification. But just by the nature of how everyone's kind of patenting up everything, it's kind of hard to move those things over. And so I think as a society, we also should be thinking about this. And so today, what I wanted to tell you was my sunscreen project uh, that is a nano project. And it's also, I'm, putting, I'm going to put it in the framework of this bigger picture of how we thought about it as we were moving through this sort of research process. And then I think at the end, I want to come back to sort of, not mistakes, I wouldn't say we made mistakes, but if we would engage people earlier in other disciplines, I think we'd probably be two or three years ahead of where we're at today. So I want to come back to that because I think nano kind of fits into that. And it all starts off, here's my timeline, it starts off with a basic discovery. And we're going to call it, I'm going to call it with back of a better word, nano lasers. And you're going to wonder how these nano lasers are going to end up in sunscreen, but I'll show you in a second. And then uh, going from the very basic physics to even starting a brand new PhD student today, and then uh, having a patent filed in 2008 based on some proof of concept, and now having a business kind of spinning off. And then uh, when, a big question for us is when do we start toxicity and ethics and stuff like that, which I'm going to admit that it was too late in this case. Um, so now if you could bear with me for a minute, I know this is a very mixed crowd, and so I, I did this for Jerry's sake. He loves physics, I understand, right? No? Okay. But I wanted to tell you sort of how some of these things actually work, and because uh, it's, it's, it's a neat application of what we're going to do, and you could just kind of look at it, and luckily I'm a physicist, so I simplify everything, which is a good thing, right? Unlike you see this big bulky molecule that a chemist shows. But nevertheless, we're working on... The materials that we want to put in sunscreen are liquid crystal based derivatives. And so they actually look very much like what you'd find in a laptop computer screen. Okay? So there's a lot of information out there on these materials, although we use a different type or a flavor, so to speak. But uh, we, we know a lot about them. First and foremost, they're elongated. Okay? And so what that means is that when they align up in, in, uh, in a phase like this, they actually can move like a fluid but they're ordered in, some, in one, at least one direction like a crystal or a solid. And so they'll have properties of flow, just much like a fluid, you know, like milk, and then they'd have uh, optical properties very much like you would see in a solid. And then what's neat about them is you can put an electric field or a battery up to it, and you can actually make these things move, okay, and align them. And I'm going to use this aligning mechanism to actually create sunscreen later on. And then surfaces play a very important role. Because they're elongated, you can actually point them along surfaces parallel or perpendicular and get just the right configuration that you're after in terms of A, getting the right effect optically, or B, optimizing that configuration. You don't have to worry about the equations there, but uh, it's very interesting that these liquid crystals, the more you can find them, I'll just say this without looking at the picture, then you can actually get higher degrees of order, OK? And uh, this translates into a better particle that I'll show you in a second. And so they have uh, effects that you align them with electric fields, you get them in the right place, and you can capture it. And the second thing about it is they're birefringent. They have this optical property that's like a solid where different directions of light coming in will actually propagate at different speeds. And you can utilize these two things to make very innovative sort of particles. Now, before I go to tell you, I need to tell you a little bit about a laser, because we're going to call it nano lasers, but it's obviously, if we're not going to put, if we're not going to use the term nano lasers to put in sunscreen in the future, probably wouldn't sell very well, because people would be all afraid, but it has elements of a laser. So a typical laser is uh, you have mirrors, a perfect mirror and a partially reflecting mirror. There's this gain medium, which can be dye or all kinds of different things, and the light comes in, it goes through, and it has spontaneous emission, so a photon gets absorbed and one's released of different wavelengths. And then this can build up coherence, and boom, you can have a laser emission. And then a laser means that you'll have a, probably it'll be a different wavelength at a certain position in the spectrum, very important for sunscreen applications. And in addition, it'll narrow it up. So you won't have a big broad line that has like white light, red, green, blue in it, but you'll get something very narrow that's just blue light or green light or red light. And so that's what we're kind of after. And you can do distribution, distributive feedback lasers, which are things which are um, very simple that they're not like a big bulky thing on a, on, a, on a desktop, but it's a film. And it's a film with structure in it, much like a hologram. And it's something I'm going to utilize today to show you what we're up to. Now, what's very interesting about these materials, these liquid crystals, there's a certain kind that actually spin through space like this. They're helical, OK? 
And this, they reflect light in a certain bandwidth, okay? What that means is that if I put it on a thin, thin film and I smear this around, they, they look like a reflector. It looks like a green mirror to you. That's what you see in the macroscopic, a mirror, okay? And so now I have a molecular material that acts like a mirror. And so that's what we're after for the laser. And so now if you take this mirror and I put in these dyes, dye molecules, there's all different types of dyes you can use, you can actually get light coming in. It gets trapped in this cavity, this mirror goes back and forth in these molecules and builds up and coherent light comes out on the other end. And it's a film, okay? And so the idea here is I'll just show you that I can take, this is green light and that's red light, but I can shift these different peaks around to get exactly the wavelength that I want and to some extent I can get the right bandwidth that I want. Now when I come back to the application here you'll see what I mean there. Alrighty. So now the idea was is I want to make a nanoparticle that emits a certain wavelength of light. Okay? I'd like it to be laser-like. Now if you're a physicist or a chemist I'm not going to argue with you that these are real lasers. They're actually probably something more like amplified spontaneous emission where it's just narrowing the line width. And so I have these particles and I take this here and it's a liquid crystal and it's a mirror. It's a nanoparticle about 100 nanometers this way and interestingly enough for a sunscreen application I want to have a dimension that's sort of mesoscopic or macroscopic on one direction. I don't want absorption going into the body and stuff like that. Okay? So I have a nanoparticle one way and then down in this direction, it's very elongated, so it's not going to have the same sort of absorptive features and transport that a regular nanoparticle might have. So we put these dyes in, and then I can give you a particle that you shine light onto it, and it gives you a narrow blue line, or red line, or a green line, or whatever you might want that I can possibly do. Now, it's, uh, it's very simple. So light comes in, bounces around, comes out. You have laser output, but it's really a narrow line. And so you go from having a dye molecule with a Big broad, a big broad emission peak down to a, a peak of about five nanometers, okay? So now the question was, how do I make them? Well, we do a template process where we, uh, we use a template like this. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, aluminum oxide. Just go through it quickly. We fill it up with our mixture. That's our magic mixture of liquid crystals and polymers. We stabilize it, we capture it, and then we take off the aluminum and we're left with these nice particles and they look like that. And so these things, you can't see it because this is a pretty big image, but down this axis here, on the molecular scale, the molecules are twisting up like this, okay? And they're, they're tuned such that they reflect light in the visible. And then there's dyes in there. You can't also see in that picture. It's too big of a resolution, okay? So those are the things we're going to call chiroposts or whatever we want to call them, but they're nanoparticles that you shine one light in and another light comes out. So... This particular one that I want to tell you about, you shine UV light on it. We know what UV light does, right, from the sun. And then we're going to get blue light coming out, okay? And I'll show you the motivation here. So now the application. So I worked on this for a while, and I was just more or less, I was just very focused on nano lasers. I mean, I had some money from the DOD. They wanted to sprinkle them on foreign soldiers so you could track people, <laughs> and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. But, you know, it's just something that, well, you know, what do you do with that? So um, we, were, we were working on that for a while. We thought we should really figure out a way to use these in a different application, what we might be able to do with these. And so we started this model where we would interact with physicians. And, uh, and is there any physicians in here? Interact with physicians. And, uh, and what we would do is rather than have us, we wanted to get collaborations going. And rather than say, put up Professor X who will talk for an hour and a half about what he's doing or she's doing, and then let the physician talk for, you know, whatever. We decided to rather than focus on what you do, it's focus on have the physician define the problem, what's needed, where's the big problems out there, and then have the scientists and engineers figure out where they could couple in and can they solve that problem. Now, it takes a more flexible type of faculty member, it takes a more flexible type of person to say, you know, it's not what I do, but that's something I can do. I got some innovative ideas. And this has actually turned out well. Um, and so we, we, we went to this thing with these particles. We got these particles. We want to know what we can do with them. And we started getting feedback from physicians in a big event. And there's all kinds of things that you can think about. 
for photodynamic therapy, Barris esophagus, they put a UV light down your throat and they shine, they, you could, if you could put these particles there that were more laser-like, you could probably get a more intense light radiation on that would be one interesting thing. Lung cancers, macular degeneration, there's dyes used today, and if you could have more tuning capability, you probably could have a more effective sealing of the wet form of MD. Um, so there's all kinds of things. Tattoo removal's possible with these. Um, you know what happens when you turn 30, 80% of the people want to move, have their tattoos removed. That's the hard number. And so we'd focus more on protective lotions, okay? And here you go. So here's the comment. How do sunscreens work? Well, it's a combination of both inorganic and organic materials in a cream, okay? Uh, there's usually zinc oxide or titanium oxide, stuff that we're very familiar with. It's in all kinds of products already. And they scatter light and they absorb UV light. So there's two mechanisms there, scattering and absorption. Um, the organic ingredients uh, are the ones that really are the ones that are absorbing the UV light. And they also can dissipate it as heat on that. And then the SPF or the sun protection factor Usually it's a number, and it's hard, you know, there's, there's some interesting definitions of this and how people interpret it, not the definition, but it's efficacy of the UVB protection, okay, not the UVA. I'll show you that in a second. The problems with sunscreen, it's difficult to produce a complete coat all over your skin, okay. Second, even with perfect application, swimming, sweating, right, whatever you do, it, it rolls off. Uh, the sunscreens need regular application, and, when they, they, and they break down, the organic dyes do break down. Uh, in the sun, they don't last forever. And for cosmetic reasons, particles and sunscreens are sort of grounded in superfine particles. They're already nano from 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 that perspective. And again, we're looking at uh, we want to look at the whole UV spectrum. And I'm going to tell you why in a second here. And so we decided to take the sunscreen application with the doctors, and uh, and, and take it. So we defined the problem here, and we wanted to do something that was sort of parallel processing. Now this is four years later, okay, so it took some time, and I think I should have started earlier on this. But uh, we defined the expertise we needed. We had dermatologists and other types of doctors assembled the team. We actually started approvals in different ways with IRB and HIPAA and, and the IU Cook because we were doing animal studies, et cetera, that we started. And so we did that even before we knew what we had. We figured if it didn't work out, it wasn't really a waste of time. We learned a lot of things anyway, but uh, we went forward with that. And then we did, uh, we did wrote papers just like you would for any sort of basic science paper. And we had a translational component I'll tell you about. And it's interesting, um, we wanted to spin out things. And the other things we were thinking about are actually orphan diseases that you could apply this to. So you could do some interesting things as well that way. So the sunscreen was our application. We had the team together. And 61% uh, of adults use sunscreen each year. It's a high percent of incidence of skin. It's about 1.1 million cases a year in the US alone for uh, melanoma. Current lotions are not always that effective. It really depends on how you put them on, et cetera. And some lotions promote penetration of, uh, of these uh, uh, herbicides and stuff that had a mixture that took those off the market. So there's all kinds of reasons. If you're doing sunscreen and you're spraying on bug spray, that's not a good thing to do. So you can read all the papers on that. And, uh, and basically, we're looking at the whole wavelength spectrum, and I'll show you why. Uh, the UVC, for the time being, that, you, that, that, that it's nasty radiation is actually absorbed by the atmosphere, okay? So that's still okay. Um, the, uh, the UVB and UVA, which I'll, I'll give you the wavelengths in a minute, 290 to 320 here, is, uh, is where most sunscreens are really evaluated, tested, and the SPF comes from. And then the UVA is from 320 to 400, which now there's more and more evidence that this is a, a, a big problem and or bigger problem than where we're at today. And so if you look at the UVB, um, it's sunburn, and it's cause of basal cell carcinomas, the regular melanomas, and also the, the squamous cell carcinoma, so the nasty ones, and also the more mundane, not mundane, I don't want to say mundane, but the ones that are more common, uh, melanomas. And so this is where the UVB is. It's a lower intensity. And then the UVA, which is higher intensity, actually, it's wrinkling and stuff like that and premature aging, but it also, also results in, in, in melanomas. And so we wanted to be able to work on this sort of whole area, this whole spectrum here. And so what we're thinking here, was interesting, is that there's mechanisms in your DNA, okay, the chemistry of this, photochemistry, which happen. One is when the UV light comes in, uh, you have a couple of different mechanisms. You have uh, free radicals and thymine dimers. And the free radicals are difficult to deal with, but luckily 
our body repairs these fairly well with the uh, mechanisms that we have already. The uh, thymine dimers, on the other hand, uh, in your skin here, the UV light comes in, it cleaves it basically, and you get a dimer, so two molecules. And then what happens here on the DNA, you get this sort of, I guess you got a weak, there's different names for it, the bulging or cleaving on the DNA. And this part right here is responsible uh, for many of these uh, result in typical melanomas 10, 20, 30 years down the road, okay? Now, the interesting thing is, is which now this will make sense to you, is that blue light, if done in time, can repair that right away, okay? And so the concept here was, I got really motivated by a paper in 2002 by Sutherland et al., and what they did was very interesting. They took, it was human studies actually, so it's kind of neat, and they irradiated the skin, a little one centimeter piece of your skin with UV light, and they, did an ex they excised the skin, they looked at it, and they could see the DNA damage from these thymine dimers splitting apart, okay? And then they went back and they actually put blue, a certain wavelength of blue light back on it and actually could repair it, okay? So that was sort of the seminal study here. And what's interesting then, if you think about this sort of repair mechanism, is that in UV, in the sunscreen, it's absorption versus wavelength, and sunscreen's full of all this titanium and organic absorbing dyes, et cetera, and it actually sucks out all the blue light, okay? And so this is actually, if you can do it in time, blue light's a good thing because it can repair UV-damaged uh, skin, okay? And so um, the, the, the uh, different ways in which you can approach this are use nanoparticles to try to come in and just get the absorption here and then cut this off and have a very abrupt filter, so to speak, okay, a band gap or an edge gap. Um, or you can try to figure out how to use the blue light that you need to repair. And so what we did is we took our nanoparticles, we tuned them in such a way that would absorb UV light, and it re-emitted in 435 wavelength range, which is where the photochemistry is to repair that damage of those, that, to get those, uh, get those molecules stuck back together. And so uh, light comes in, it's visible, the UV light gets absorbed, comes in, it's blue, you put that back into the sunscreen, it hits your, uh, hits your skin, and we call them nano lasers, they're not really lasers, but it's a narrowing of the line width, and there you go. And uh, it's very interesting. So now a couple of things, one is the, uh, the light, when you smear this stuff on samples, it actually waveguides, and so it looks very much like a fluorescent film. Light comes in and blue will come out the edge. So if you're a very white-skinned German, for example, I don't want to pick on anybody here, but you may, have a little, you may have a little blue tint to your skin, you know, but I think the teenagers that saw this think it's really cool, look like Blue Man Crew, you know. And, uh, but uh, you really don't see it that much because it's a very, very thin layer. You don't, you, you don't, you're not glowing blue if you put this stuff on you. But uh, very exciting. We've been through several studies now, and this is the most recent, and it's human dermal fibroblasts in, in, the, uh, in, in Petri dishes. And so what we do is we do electrophoresis, and so we take our skin cells, I'll just call them skin cells for now, and we'll blast them with UV radiation. And then what you do is you put an electric field on it in this direction, and if, you, if the molecules were broken up, what happens is it pulls it apart, okay, the electric field. And so you can see where well, there's no protection, you have these big blobs, and that means this sort of, uh, the, they look like little uh, comets and stuff like that. You see them pulling apart. That means you have multiple molecules that broke apart there. That's not a good thing. And then with sunblock, you still have the same kind of thing going on. Not as bad as this. But then when we put our nano lasers down, you get very pinpointing, so it's repairing that. And it's just, I don't have the data to share with you today because I'm not confident enough to tell you what the time is. But it's something that doesn't, you can't let this go on for two or three hours, then put the stuff on and expect it to heal it. It's gonna be done relatively in a short time period. I mean, it's not gonna be minutes, but it's gonna be within an hour. It's sort of where I'm at now with this. And so we've done all kinds of experiments, and now we're ready to kind of move this thing on. And uh, we started, we have a program at Notre Dame. It's called the STEAM, Engineering Science Entrepreneurship Excellence Master's Program. And uh, we had a group of business students actually take this uh, and think about it in terms of creating a business out of it and how you might do a licensing, start your own company, et cetera. And so it was just fascinating to actually work with them. 
And I think several things came out, which I wish I would have known earlier. <laughs> so a lot of things come out, you know, the, the, the various approval processes. We had consultants, we had people that were, uh, actually we spoke with Procter & Gamble, we actually had people that were left Procter & Gamble and stuff like that. So it's funny, if all the things that you now, we have to, not, now we really understand what we have to do, uh, in fact, is interesting because you wonder why anybody would want to start any company after knowing what's ahead of you in this. But there's just a lot to do. You heard a lot about it earlier on today. But uh, I think we're really committed to this. And uh, they define the market size. It's interesting that you have, it's a, over a billion dollar market. It's, over, it's even bigger in Europe, the market for sunscreen. And the second thing is, which is interesting from a business perspective, that, it's, that sunscreens that are healing and or you know, in this category of drugs, so to speak, is uh, they're, they're regulated in the U.S. and they're much less regulated in Europe. So there may be a different way to, to do it and get it out there that involves a different market off the bat. Now, I just wanted to show you kind of some things here because I just sort of been thinking about this project as a whole and how it influenced sort of my research agenda. And it's like right smack dab in the middle of nanoparticles for an actual use, a medical use. And, um, and, and I think it's interesting that I did not do this. I did not do the science, the value creation, and then figure out what the impact was. I mean, it's not as mature as asbestos anyway, so we're not doing that. But what we did do, we started with this basic science, we had other ideas for it, and then we started thinking about value creation and other applications, and then we're just really starting about impact now, and um, there's all kinds of things to think about that we learned when we started thinking about creating a business out of this, and uh, the eth eth ethics of this as well. Now. The value creation thing, you know, every time we learn something from the business world or from the regulatory war world, we had to go back and redo the science, essentially, you know. It was one of those type of things. And so um, I think in the future, especially in nano here, we should have been, I mean, you start off things with basic discoveries in science, but you should be asking those questions about ethics and impact and human health very early on. I, I, I really must say I wish I would have done it earlier because I think I would have been much, much further along than I was today. And then start the value creation and the impact. Think about the ethical nature of this, what it may, how it may impact people or the environment, et cetera, uh, how it may impact health of people, and start doing this much earlier than you otherwise do. If the science doesn't turn out, it's not interesting, and everyone learns something, so what? You know, you move on and do something else. But I can tell you, I, I really think I would be, you know, where we're at today with this and what we learn from the business and also some of the ethics. I think we've been w much further ahead of, of time. So what's next is we have toxicity we're dealing with. We have a, a group now that's funded at Notre Dame that they do the uh, frog's egg stuff and looking at cells and things like that. I suspect I'm going to have a problem with some uh, irritation stuff on the skin. Some of these materials are known irritants. They, uh, in liquid crystal displays, if it gets on your skin or on a rabbit, they itch a little bit, and so that's been remedied, so I, we know the chemistry to, to get rid of that and still have a liquid crystal phase, but nevertheless, I do have elements of that in my current material set. We're gonna go then, we're gonna get this situated, we're gonna go to animal studies here, and there's a, uh, a uh, hairless mouse model. Uh, no jokes on the hairless piece, but uh, there's a hairless mouse model that actually comes down with melanoma very quickly um, when you hit it with UV light, so there's a great mouse model out there to look at. And then we'll go to the human studies. And, and there, there was just one question we had here. We decided to do the animal studies, but since that Sutherland group actually started with human studies, and it's just a small thing, it's a very low risk procedure to, to bop your skin with a little bit of UV light and, and, do, and take a piece off and look at it and all that, the pathology. But uh, I think we, we decided that there'd be a lot more value in doing the animal studies first. And it's not a long process either once it's approved. So. Anyway, um, this, in this whole context, it's just, I just wanted to mention this and promote it a little bit, but Notre Dame is part of a consortium of five universities in Indiana as part of a National Institute of Health Clinical Science Translational Institute. It's a big award. In the end, it's about $50 million uh, over 10 years. It's about half from the NIH, half from the state and, and sharing. But nevertheless, it's, it's sort of, its aspect is biomedical, but it's to actually translate and accelerate things faster to the marketplace. and so. I think with, a, with this kind of framework that's really new in the state, uh, projects like this one that I showed you will actually be able to, I think, be able to adapt and accelerate further along because there's a lot of people with experience in the medical school that can help us out. There's a lot of business people around here that can help us out. So anyway, 
I'm kind of done. I just wanted to frame sort of that project. I think it's interesting because it's a very different way in which people are thinking about sunscreen. But frame it in, the, in, the, in sort of in the context of how we should be thinking about research in the future, especially those re research projects that are highly translational, uh, like what we have with the Nano, uh, Nano Center here. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you for the invitation. Wonderful. Go ahead, just you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, I'm, a, I have a, I'm a patient and also a physician. <laughs> and one of the interesting, I have significant skin disease. And I had bounced through about six dermatologists on several issues. And so after I realized that physicians really don't know what they're doing in many things when we talk with, about being a patient, I, had, I decided to do the epidemiology of melanoma myself. Yeah. And I, here's the question uh, with a little bit more preface. There, there's a lot of stuff in these diseases that we don't understand, like melanoma is debated whether it's a carcinoma or a neuroendocrine tumor, yeah. et cetera. And I found in, in my readings that the immune system does a whole lot more as determinations of who gets melanoma and who doesn't. Yeah. Did, did you integrate the immune system at all in your thought processes in here, and if so, how? Not really, no. <laughs> that was an easy answer, honest answer, no. But it's a very good point, very, very good point. Yeah. The basal cell and all the other parts yeah. are very interesting. Yeah. Hey, Greg, among the many challenges of translating a, you know, a physics laboratory <laughs> finding into a commercial product would be uh, sort of passing through the process engineering kind of world. Yeah. And so you have a template-based process. Have you thought about how, to, how would you scale that up? Into yeah. So I th in, in the end, you know, I think the uh, template-based process is not the right approach. Because obviously, if you look at how much sort of titanium oxide is used in this country, and that's going to be the scale of what we need here, it's just it's it's extraordinary, and so uh, we won't go with the template-based approach. But the the positives of the template approach are a that you have a nano dimension on one side, and b that it's you can make it macroscopic. I mean, really macroscopic or mesoscopic on the other side, so you don't have the problems with absorption and translation. Now, it's interestingly enough, if you get the right particle that gives you uh, the position of the, the line width that you need, the wavelength, um, that's easy to do. And the line width, which is a little bit hard to do with a particle, but nevertheless quantum dots, which are a nanoparticle, give you that. And so quantum dots are just as effective as this. However, they're tiny and, uh, and they will get into your system. And I don't think we even know to start with. I know you work yeah. with them a bit. And they contain the, cadmium, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just, there's, a, there's a big open question. And, uh -huh. so, and there's also some, some uh, some rare earth lanthanides that also are good materials that have narrow bandwidth. So there's other options, but uh, we would like to avoid the whole question and just prove, I mean, we don't have to even prove it because it will work that you don't get the sort of absorption and trans uh, and uh, right. transport. Do you have a, a piece of your team that's like actively working on uh, economical processes that would pr produce a No, I don't, I don't, we haven't, we haven't even thought about that yet. I, I, I would love to, uh, I, we've done it, it works well, I would love to be able to dump uh, quantum dots right in and do it because it would be easy and our patent covers that in terms of our patent application but I'm just not sure I think that it's going to be a lot further down the road before we kind of know what that is and we're still thinking we can get the macro nano aspect ratio. Can, can you just clarify I thought the the information you had on about the chiral post was interesting can you clarify so the length of the chiral post really is not uh, providing any unique attributes no, that's interesting. So here, it, it, that's a, it's a very good question. Let me just give you the, it's 100 nanometers around this way, so it's right on the edge of being nano. And this guy can be, we made them five, they can be five microns or they can be 60 microns long. And so that makes it a sort of a, a macroscopic particle this way so you don't have the absorption and whatnot, okay? Now, um, what the, uh, the nano thing does, you can actually make bigger particle sizes that have the right configuration that do it, but what we're, what's interesting on, on this particular template approach with another advantage is that you get a higher degree of ordering in there that's induced by the surface, and so you get actually better action in terms of the light coming out. Now you can make them bigger, but it won't be as effective in terms of the blue light efficiency that comes out, but blue light will come out. So you don't necessarily have to be in the nano regime, but it looks like it's advantageous for, for this process step that we use, this template approach. Uh, I found your 
uh, story of discovery really interesting. And I wondered why, uh, what was it that made you think that you should have thought about the ethics earlier, and why do you think it would have saved a couple of years? There's, there's a couple of things. One is that we, in nano, I think, you know, I, I think we're actually as a country and stuff, and as funding agency, we're actually doing it right. We're really starting to think about it. It's sort of being mandated, but to do some of these things in our grants and research, et cetera. But I think that in general, if, uh, if, if we were to start thinking about sort of ethics and integration of what this means earlier on and engaged ethicists and or people that were more involved in human health, I think we would have been pushed it sort of way up further in terms of uh, what could be, okay? I think we would have figured out what, what, was, what was great about the idea and stuff like that much earlier on. If we would engage the business folks ahead of time, and I, I mean, I, I shouldn't say, I, I don't want to say, I want to say the innovation folks. I think people at Procter & Gamble would have my neck if I called them, they call themselves innovators, but um, we would have really have known what the, what the sort of aspects were from the FDA and, and what they already knew about cosmetics and creams and lotions, because I had to go back and redo things. I mean, that's, that was the thing. I was just making the best light emitting particle. And in the end, it was, you know, which, which would work best for that application and emit light. And so we didn't do that. And so, um, and right now I, I, I know I have a, you know, these things make bunnies itch. And so I know I have that problem. And so we have to go back and do the science so we have a, a different material, which we can do, but it's not going to be a skin irritant and stuff like that. So I think just in general, it would have been, well, we would, we would have been at least two years ahead of, ahead of schedule. And, um, and I do think it, the, the way things are going now in science, this is a general philosophical comment, so you can forget it if you want. But, uh, you know, we're mucking around, nanoscience, you're mucking around with all kinds of things. You're, you're, you, there's a potential to cure great diseases. There, in the stem cell stuff, you can grow all kinds of interesting things now. There's cloning, there's transgenesis, there's gene chips. And I think it, there's no point, I think, in history as it is today in which there's so much that we can do and know, and there's so many open questions about the ethics of this depending where you come from, countries, religion, race, et cetera, that we should be addressing earlier on. Um, I just don't think there's been any point in history where you really thought about that as, as, as much as we should be thinking about it now because we're really changing medicine in a big way right now and there's big questions associated with that. Okay, well, why don't we open it up 